So let's move on. Um, as I said, CEP changed its name in the in Washington to um, character.org, but the Center for the Fourth and Fifth Hours is the one that will grant the accreditation if it is done here in Asia with the concurrence of Dr. Thomas Licona. So all the schools that have so far been uh, accredited, all the um, final papers, the self-evaluations that the school submitted um, were also passed on to Dr. Licona, were also sent to uh, New York in Center, sorry, in the Center for the Fourth and Fifth Arts in the State University of New York. And we needed uh, Dr. Licona's approval for us to be able to grant accreditation. And in the two occasions that we did accreditation, we elevated schools as schools of character. In fact, we took advantage of his presence here in Manila or in Davao or in Cebu to be able to do the um, elevation to schools of character. Okay, that's why we also call it Dr. Thomas Licona Institute of Asia. I'd like to share with you this video first from CEP. Hi, my name is Mark Hyatt, and I'm the president and CEO of the Character Education Partnership, also known as CEP. CEP is a national advocate and leader for the character education movement. Based in Washington, D.C., in the United States, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan coalition of organizations and individuals committed to fostering effective character education in schools in the United States and around the world. I mention schools around the world because we're working diligently with a number of countries to positively affect their own schools, teachers, students, and communities. One of those countries is the Philippines one of several CEP international affiliates. In fact, we're working with Emmanuel Rentoy, a teacher from the School of Education of the University of Asia and the Pacific, to formally establish our affiliate in your country called CEP Philippines. Mr. Emmanuel has been instrumental in working with us to develop a memorandum of understanding in which CEP in the United States and the CEP in the Philippines will exchange and share innovative and best practices in character education. In addition, CEP in the United States will offer CEP Philippines a discounted menu of professional development consultation services and materials and resources intended to further develop Philippine character education infrastructure. And our two organizations, organizations will advertise and promote each other at character-related events, programs, and trainings. Mr. Emmanuel is now eligible for appointment as an international delegate to our board of directors and other advisory groups such as the CEP President's Advisory Council and Education Advisory Council. We wish to thank him for his dedicated work and we appreciate that CEP the Philippines has been made possible with the full support of Vibal Publishing Together with the Philippines, we look forward to developing young people everywhere who are educated, inspired, and empowered to be ethical and engaged citizens. Okay, well, that's Mark Hyatt, the, pres the um, former president of um, CEP. And um, after his term, the one who took over is... Uh, Becky Saipos. Now it's uh, they had a new election, but uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we were all deprived of uh, actual conference for last year. They could not proceed. Okay, well, I needed to show that to convince you that uh, <laughs> the accreditation that we give here in the Philippines is uh, equally. Um, how they call that, prestigious, as the one that they grant in the United States. And as I said, the, before we are able to grant accreditation to a school, as a school of character, we need the um, consent approval of uh, Dr. Thomas Licona himself, the author of these 11 principles that I'm going to share with you. Okay, uh, so it, CEP holds the biggest character education conference in the United States every year. 800 to 1,000 participate in that. 
and I have been attending since 2011, year after year, which is what enabled me to get the license or the franchise, if you want to call it that way, for the Philippines. By the way, and um, that is what has brought me around the Philippines, reaching out to administrators especially, because they're the ones in a position to say, let's go for accreditation, okay? <laughs> it's the administrators. And so with the help of Vibal Publishing for many years, I was going around. Up to now, I've been able to reach out to more than 75,000 teachers and administrators around the Philippines. And we hope to reach out to more. This was in Iloilo, this is in Cebu, uh, in SMX. So we, of course, I've been telling you about the international conference that I have been organizing uh, around the Philippines, bringing in experts, especially from CEP. Um, most of the speakers I have brought to the Philippines, in fact, are board members of uh, Character Education Partnership. Bottom line, this is it. We want to teach the young people to be good people. And we want to remind teachers, and this is what I've been repeating over and over the past seven days. Please tell your teachers to teach for character, to make character formation a top priority, to stop simply covering the curriculum and really make an impact, make a difference in the lives of the students by raising them up to be not just smart, but good. Not just experts in science, but virtuous men and women of character. No exemption. Whatever subject we're teaching, we can. I'm going to share again with you those principles I've shared because I saw there were some who said this is their first session, these seven days. So we want to help you, schools, teachers, how to be able to do it. The 11 principles actually are the answers to the question, how can we know if we are effective in forming character? Um, that are schools, I mean, okay, most schools would like to claim that they uh, form character, right? Most schools would like to claim that they are not just interested in uh, um, academics, that they also want to form, mold minds, uh, form character. The question is, how sure are you you're doing it effectively? Well, the answer of the experts led by Dr. Licona, together with a whole team of the experts in the field, like Dr. Michelle Borba, like Hal Urban, those people precisely that we've been getting ideas from the past seven days, they sat down, spent a long um, time meeting, discussing, arguing, and they came up with this 11. And they said, this is it. If you have this 11, you must be effective in giving character formation. But they said, in fact, you don't, you don't need to be doing all the 11. Even just eight of the 11, if you're doing them, you must be a school of character. You deserve to be elevated as an example for the others. So CEP has been doing this for the last 11 years that I started it here in the Philippines. Training, like what we're doing now. Conferences, like what we had with Dr. Borba last April 13 and 14 on how to raise the mentally healthy kids during these troubled times. And then resources, materials, and I'm going to share with you some big bargains. What I bought in the U.S. for $600, I'm going to make it available for you for $20. <laughs> less, actually, less than $20. What I got for $600, I'm making available later. I'm going to talk to you about that. And then the fourth thing we're doing is elevating schools so that schools that want to become schools of character, they ask, how can we do it? Well, we already have six elevated to that category and effectively, what we're saying is, you want to know how it's done? Visit the schools. Interview the people who uh, are there. Find out from them how they do it, how they complied with the 11 principles. Because that's the idea of, that's the idea of accreditation. It's not just for prestige. It's for the community to know that 
this is a school of character. Their doors are open for anyone who wants to learn about how to become a school of character. And uh, it has been made clear to them when they applied for accreditation, we made it very clear to them, by the way, please keep in mind that this is not just for prestige. It means you are allowing other schools to look into your system, to look into how you're doing things, to look into how they can to become a school of character. So all these uh, conferences I've been organizing are really nothing else but equipping more and more teachers, schools, on how to be able to do it, on how to become schools of character. During the visit of Hal Urban with uh, Fred Jones, that was the time we elevated um, the first two schools as schools of character. That was in SMX, and then they also did it in the University of Asia in the Pacific. Now, of course, our uh, first concern was we need accreditors, right? We need people who would know how to do the visitation, how to do the accreditation. So the first activity I organized with CEP was to bring the executive director during that time. This was in 2013, Dr. Russell Joyner. And he gave us a four-day conference or three-day conference on how to um, do accreditation, how to look into these 11 principles. So this was participated in by 65 administrators from all over the Philippines, from uh, up north all the way down to uh, Cotabato. The one speaking there in the microphone, in fact, is the principal, the directress of uh, Notre Dame of um, Cotabato. Um, it was typhoon signal number two, uh, sorry, yeah, number two. That's why while we were having this session, uh, all the schools and universities around uh, Metro Manila were already called off. I mean, they already called off classes, but we proceeded with the sessions and uh, the 65 effectively are all now qualified to be part of the accrediting team that uh, I would bring to the different schools. So, but for now, uh, I usually invite officers from the six accredited schools. For example, you want a visitation and you want us to check if you, how you're doing with your 11 principles. I usually invite this, um, some teachers or officers from schools that have already been accredited. They become accreditors. Okay, this is what I posted in Facebook earlier, the score sheet of the 11 principles. And if you uh, have not been able to download it, please do so. If you are not in Facebook, send me an email so I can send you the file, the 27 page file on um, scoring, how, how to do the scoring of the 11 principles, which with the help of Vibal, we launched in, in the presence of administrators of around 200 uh, schools. Catholic schools during the SEAP in uh, Cebu. And every now and then, I also still get invited to speak in Washington, D.C. or in San Francisco, wherever the school of, um, the, wherever the conference of the CEP or character.org is held. The last one I attended was held in, um, um, it was not in Washington, D.C. It was in Atlanta. And that's where we had the conference. Okay, so I find ways of being still connected with those colleagues from all over the world. How many have been accredited so far? Six. So um, when we started CEP, we opened uh, institutional memberships. We put this on hold for now because not very many new resources are being made available. Plus, of course, one of the things that you're supposed to get if you um, join as an institution in CEP or now Center for the Fourth and Fifth Arts, one of the benefits is I would have to go to your school to give a, uh, an, an initiation uh, seminar. <laughs> uh, um, the first seminar, which is the urgency of character formation to all this, uh, the teachers uh, of the school. But we have to put that on hold while we are in this situation. 
but uh, we hope to be able to resume that as soon as um, we get back to normal situation, normal condition, normal circumstances. So um, Harry Wong uh, sessions and the conference that he did helped us reach out to many more teachers. And that is how we are able to spread the message of uh, this accreditation, this um, working towards really making your school a school of character. I also mentioned to you that um, part of what we organize in the Catalyst is this series of conferences on chastity, purity. This was the biggest we had with 15,000 people in World Trade Center. Um, we also invite other experts like uh, Dr. Ian Jukes talking about the digital generation. He spoke in Iloilo, in Cebu, in SMX reaching out to more than 10,000 teachers. So this is how we are able to spread out the word about becoming schools of character um, through these international conferences. The best speaker on chastity, Jason Everett, we brought him already four times to Manila. No? The, um, this was in TICC where he spoke to 4,000 students in the morning and then 4,000 students in the afternoon. Okay, so we take advantage of these international speakers when they are around to do the elevation to schools of character. This is Dr. Thomas Licona uh, five years ago or six years ago even uh, when we elevated for the first time Child Link School of Cebu. It's the second school that was uh, elevated to the level of school of character. It's a um, school there in Cebu, a co-ed school, and it's uh, fantastic in the way they uh, foster student involvement, student empowerment. The, um, it's wonderful, you know, when you enter the school and you're welcomed by student welcomers. <laughs> so they have that kind of, uh, they, they have that kind of strategy. By the way, there were some schools that applied as school of character, but they did not qualify. So instead, we gave recognition to some of their strategies. Okay, so that's what usually happens. You apply as a school of character. We look into the 11 principles, how you're doing it, what are your uh, strategies, what are your systems. If you don't get to qualify, meaning to say you do not satisfy eight of the 11 principles, then we look for the best practices you have, and then we give recognition to those, uh, effectively telling you, you still have a chance, try again next time, maybe you just need to work on the other principles. Now, in the case of this um, child link, they qualified, and so 2016, so that was uh, five years ago. And then 2019, they underwent Reaccreditation. So the accreditation is good for three years. And after the third year, you can reapply for reaccreditation. And we do the visitation again well, after you do your self evaluation. And then we look at, uh, at those 11 principles. We interview students, we interview parents, we interview teachers, we even interview non academic staff to check on the implementation of those 11 principles to check if your self-evaluation um, jibes with reality. And then the evaluators meet and um, we form a draft of the final recommendation um, letter that we will give to the school and we vote on it, whether we will give the accreditation or not, re-accreditation or not, or we're just going to give recognition to some best practices. So this was in 2019 when Dr. Licona went back to Cebu. Um, and that's where we did the accreditation, the um, reaccreditation. Okay. And then the other school that qualified, uh, this is the third. The first one is Morning Star Montessori School in Laguna. They uh, have two campuses, one in Pansol, uh, the other one in, oh, sorry, one in Calamba, the other one in um, Iri, Los Baños. 
And I tell you, you should visit the school if you want to see what it means to have a courteous, kind, welcoming environment. When I, every time I visit the school, I, I never, um, it never fails. I always get impressed with the way every student, every teacher, every non-academic staff that I meet along the corridor would greet me with genuine courtesy because it, it's part of their system. Um, I've been to other schools where I mentioned to you sometimes you walk around and you see students running around ignoring you. Worse, even sometimes teachers who would not stop to greet or to uh, acknowledge your presence. I mean, not that we are expecting special treatment, but um, you know, a school's culture, even just walking around the campus for the 15 minutes, you'll be able to see many things, especially if you know the 11 principles. I'll tell you a very interesting story about Taref Springdale, how they went about the accreditation. I mean, I'll tell you already, the first time we visited this school around uh, eight years ago, Dr. Borba spent uh, around 30 minutes walking around uh, with a student mm -hmm. who was assigned to show her around. At the end of the 30 minutes, Dr. Borba whispered to me, why did you bring me here to this lousy school? <laughs> why did you bring me here to this lousy school? And then uh, after, after that encounter, the, they had a new chaplain who, uh, who heard about the accreditation, the 11 principles. And immediately he asked for all the materials and he asked me to go there to brief them about the 11 principles. And they seriously worked on implementing the 11 principles. And two years later, they told us we're ready. And we, we uh, went there with uh, seven accreditors. And I tell you, it's a totally different school that we saw. It was transformed. In fact, I'll tell you later, especially when we reach principle number one of the 11 principles, even just that principle, if that's the only one that they implemented, they would have really um, been transformed totally. That's part of Springdale, which is now a school of character, twice. Um, accredited. I mean, in the last visit of Dr. Licona, 2019, it qualified again for reaccreditation. That's Paref Springdale, an all boys school in Cebu City. So you have um, Morning Star Montessori School in Laguna, Child Link in Cebu, Paref Springdale in Cebu. And then uh, this was the um, elevation to the reaccreditation as School of Character. And then the most recent one that qualified is Ridley International School, an international school that is based there in um, Pasig City um, near C5. It used to be along C5 and then now they are in this Carlo Caparasa Avenue. Um, that's the most recent school that uh, qualified together with the first ever university that managed to qualify. Um, Holy Angel University, thanks to their president, Dr. Kalingo, who really worked hard in making it happen. It's a fantastic story that uh, because of their elevation to the School of Character, we recommended to them, you know, some of your strategies are so fantastic. Why don't you submit them to Washington, D.C. for competition? We recommended especially their strategy uh, called no student uh, left hungry, no student uh, uncared for. Uh, they have a strategy where teachers and even some students and non-academic staff can contribute to a pool of fund, to a fund, so that students who don't even have money for lunch can borrow from there because no one should ever have to go hungry. Not in your university, where there is a, where, which is supposed to be a caring community, 
which is supposed to be a kind and caring community. So people freely um, contribute to that common fund. And anyone who really is in dire need of lunch can go there to, uh, can go to the canteen and charge his lunch, his meal to that fund. And then when they are in a better position, they too can repay that or contribute or um, it's fantastic. I mean, that's where you really can say <laughs> this is a university of character where they care for the students in the real sense of the word, not just uh, um, in posters, in tarpaulins, but in, real, um, in reality. So we asked them to submit it to Washington DC for um, competition and it won. It was given recognition as one of the best practices. The, they had to send two officers to Washington DC to attend the conference um, to receive the recognition. Unfortunately, that was the year I could not go. The, um, as I was on my way to the airport, I received word that my father was rushed to the hospital. And in fact, he would die a few hours after that. That was the only time I missed the conference aside from the pandemic that um, prevented uh, the organizers to even hold one. They held an online one last March, but I really tell you it's, it's different when you are in a room with 1,000 champions of character from all over the world uh, because there are participants now who come from China, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, um, the last time I attended, even from Africa, from uh, Portugal, from Spain. So, uh, but majority of course are from the United States. Uh, in the case of ChildLink, we have to do their re-accreditation, uh, elevation, re-elevation, the School of Character in Davao when Tom Licona went there in 2019 to hold a series of conference. So Morningstar Montessori School, I want you to put that in your bucket list <laughs> to be able to visit the school uh, with their fantastic directress, teacher Hedy Tordesillas, who is one of the most amazing champions of character in the Philippines. She has been running the school and all the while, all throughout this um, 25, 30 years that the school has been in existence, she always had that in mind. First and foremost, character. But she didn't have any system. She just came up with ideas. And then she met us and um, she was in the first batch of 65 that were trained by Dr. Sojourner. And she also joined me in uh, Kuala Lumpur once to attend a conference on character formation. Okay, so Paris Springdale, Ridley International School, Holy Angel University, you might be the next school if you put your heart into really making character formation a top priority and say our school has got to be known as a school of character and not only known as a school of character but uh, we have to put systems in place so that no matter who uh, no matter uh, if we have new teachers coming in or new administrators taking over, the systems are in place, we continue to be a school of character. So Aristotle said, people do not naturally become morally excellent or practically wise. They become so, if at all, only as the result of lifelong personal and community effort. And this is the beautiful thing about the accreditation or the 11 principles. It is like getting everybody together to own the idea of we've got to become a real school of character, effectively forming character of our students. Because this is urgent and important. The past few days, we have been talking a lot about the crisis in society. Many young people today don't find anything wrong anymore with cut and pasting and then submitting that um, as their own, uh, changing some words so that they can quieten their conscience and say, it's already mine. I changed the order, the active voice to passive, 
I mean, you and I know it's cheating. It's dishonesty. That is so rampant. And some of these people will go on to become um, senators and congressmen. And guess what they're going to do when they're there sitting in power? Well, we talked about <clears throat> bullying on two occasions. A kind and caring classroom and caring and safe, safe and caring school last Saturday. Um, two seminars focused on wiping out bullying. And then the young people are living in this highly sexualized culture that they hear about sex in music, in movies, in TV shows, in TV series, in uh, there's the internet, uh, social media. This is, the, this is the reason why I, even if it costs a lot, we continue working on getting these chastity speakers to come. We continue organizing these purity talks because it's one of the biggest challenges, especially among the young people today. And then vulgarity, immorality. All these are crises that we see in the world today. Not to mention a lifestyle of the young people uh, that has been described as sleep-deprived, um, narcissistic. I mean, never have we had this kind of culture where the self is elevated as like the God. I mean, uh, don't let anyone dictate on what you believe in, on what you um, want to do, uh, do as you like. That's self-centeredness, that's narcissistic, that's vanity. And that is a kind of uh, culture that the young people are growing up in, uh, highly self-centered. So real key solution, character formation moral literacy, moral intelligence. This is the only way we will be able to solve the crisis we see in the world today. Not CCTV, not installing high definition cameras to catch those cheaters. That's not going to solve the problem. Uh, not through um, punishments, a lot of punishments, penalties, Sanctions, you know, we put these punishments in place to threaten those who will even think of uh, cheating, bringing pornographic materials, etc. No, Dr. Borba says enhancing moral intelligence is our best hope to get these young people on the right course so that they act and think right. Okay, uh, and uh, like what we said in all the six days of the seminar so far, in all the first six days, example, is the only effective way, is a first step according to Michelle Borba, but we have always said it's the only effective way to teach character formation, to do the powerful example of our life. Okay, the purpose of the School of Character Accreditation is to get all these positive results. Academics, good. Behavior, good. Culture and climate, good. You know schools. You know problematic schools. It's not your school. It's your neighboring, neighboring school. <laughs> it's the schools in your neighborhood. You sometimes say academics there is low. The standards are low. Sometimes you say, that's a very, um, it's a very nice school, very, um, how do you call that, high tech, but the students are always uh, problematic discipline wise. There's problem of behavior. Or uh, I, know, I know a billionaire, one day they were going around, they wanted to buy a university and they, they were about to buy one university but they discovered that the culture there is uh, one that is like a um, haven of drug addicts. There are many cases of drugs and uh, so they didn't. They went to UANP and asked, are you for sale? <laughs> we're looking for a university to buy. <laughs> we had to tell them, sorry, we're not for sale. We may be deficitary sometimes because 
uh, one fourth of our students are on scholarship, but uh, we will manage. We're not for sale. <laughs> so um, you see, if these three are good, wow, that's a fantastic school. And schools of character have to have these three. Academics should not be low standards. Behavior of the students should display character, virtues, values. And the prevailing culture or climate is one where you know they value values. And so it's fantastic. When a school undergoes accreditation, necessarily, you will have to involve the parents. You will have to involve the teachers. You will have to involve the non-academic staff. And you will have to even involve the students and alumni. So it's fantastic when you have all the stakeholders coming together to have a, the same mindset. Let's work on making our school effective in really giving formation. And then like any accreditation, uh, companies would undergo ISO accreditation. You, many of you have undergone PAASCU, um, PAKUKOA. Um, those are all fantastic exercises because they make you reflect. How are we doing things? How are our standards compared to the um, accepted level out there? How are we compared to other schools put side by side in terms of facilities, in terms of faculty development, in terms of uh, student uh, resources, materials, etc. Now, in this case, we will reflect how are we effective as a school of character? Are we a caring community? Do we involve everyone in the community in achieving character goals? So uh, all the questions are related to character building. And it's fantastic when you get all the stakeholders thinking all along the same line, let's make character formation a top priority. And what many schools uh, appreciate, even the um, schools that have been accredited, they find the document that they receive informing them that they are elevated as a school of character. For them, the document is like a, a SIP, School Improvement Plan. It shows them uh, what else to work on to become a real excellent school in terms of character formation, in terms of character building. And the um, documents are written by people like Dr. Ernesto Grillo, who is one of the speakers in the series in June, or um, uh, Teacher Hedy, who has been an expert in running that school. Or um, in the last uh, evaluation visits we did, to Holy Angel University, we had also teachers from um, Ridley who participated and joined us in the visitation. Okay, so let's talk about the 11 principles. What I'm going to do is to explain the 11 principles one by one. Um, we're going to do it in slow motion. I'm going to do the process for the first three so that you get an idea. And then after the first three, you will know how to go about doing it in the remaining eight using that handout that I asked you to download. Okay, as I said, if you were not able to download it because you're not in Facebook, send me an email to catalystpedias at gmail.com so I can send you the document and discuss that with your faculty. So this is not a policy. These 11 principles are not a program. They are merely a guide to help focus on the things that really matter when trying to change the culture of the school, to become one that is the champion's character formation. Okay, I'll immediately give you the 11. Don't worry if you get lost along the way. Um, this is a quick overview of all the 11 principles. But we're, as I said, we're going to go over each one of them one by one in slow motion. Number one, are you guided by core values? Now, you remember, I've been talking about that in the class advisory and also in classroom management. If we are driven by core values, then 
you can um, make your students level six thinkers where you say students please do behave inside and outside the school uh, because you're carrying the name of the school yeah. when you say that you're implying that the name of the school is equivalent to certain values core values okay so do you are you driven by core values are you guided by core values but okay we have core values it's in our tarpaulin but do you assess it on a regular basis on a semestral basis on a monthly basis or even on a weekly basis because uh, i know some schools that do faculty development meetings or sessions on a weekly basis and they make sure they touch on our core values. Do you assess it? I know some schools, they have a tarpaulin and they list down there. These are the values that uh, are that guide our way here in this school. And then you ask, uh, when was the last time you had a faculty meeting about the core values? I, none. We had it in the teacher orientation of uh, three years ago when I was accepted then you fail in principle number 11. <laughs> so principle number one, you're guided by core values. But principle number 11, on the other hand, is, is it alive? Do you evaluate it? Do you assess it? Do you look back to it and check very often if we are going along the right direction? Principle number two, of course, right away would be that you have character formation. You have character formation strategies in place systems in place but we have to make sure that you address the thinking the feeling and the acting cognitive affective and behavioral not merely ah yeah we have talks okay but do you expect the students to perform behaving do you expect the students to appreciate the teachers and then we cannot forget how about the parents and the non-academic staff. Do you also provide character formation for them? And then the rest are inside this wheel. Comprehensive. It cannot just be for teachers in their beginning years, uh, part of their orientation or part of their initiation program. And then... Once they reach second year, ah, there are no more sessions, there are no more talks, there are no more, ah, it's not comprehensive. Or, ah, yes, we're very strong in grade school, but uh, we cannot implement this in high school because the biology, chemistry, um, uh, calculus teachers are not um, big fans of these things. They think we need to focus on technical training. Ah, you're not going to pass number three in fact there's one there's one school that uh, attempted to be given a recognition as a school of character and that's what we saw grade school very strong high school there is resistance uh, sorry but we cannot we just have to give recognition to one of your best practices that we have to tell people this is very good practice so comprehensive it has to be intentional proactive and it includes the whole um, school. Number four, caring community. That's why one of the things we do when we visit a school is to ask the students, is there bullying in your school? Do the teachers care for the students? Do the teachers care for the parents? How do you show it? Do the parents care for the teachers? How do they show it? How can we see it? Prove it. Show us documents, show us pictures even, or videos of parents with teachers uh, celebrating together um, in that kind and caring atmosphere. <laughs> so caring community, moral action that the students get engaged in doing moral activities, outreaches, outreaches here and there, um, community service, um, student volunteer work. Those are moral action. Meaningful academic curriculum. That's why I love these 11 principles. It makes sure it does not put academics as something um, in the back, um, back burner, in the secondary. No, 
um, it doesn't mean you have to lower your standards in academics. We will look at your academic curriculum and see if uh, you might be full of all these activities that are highly formative, but the students lag behind in math, lag behind in science, lag behind in uh, whatever skilled subjects they're supposed to be learning. There's failure in number six. Self-motivation. Students are um, do the right thing, the moral thing, not because you have so many um, punishments in place or rewards in place. No, they do the right thing because you find ways that the students are self-motivated. Staff learning community, we look into this, we check, uh, can we see your program of formation for your teachers? How about for your non-teaching academic staff? Do you also form them? If we look at your teacher development sessions, and it's all about technical things, how to teach reading, how to foster love for um, reading, how to um, not be afraid of numbers in math. <laughs> okay, they're very nice, they're technical, but where do you, did you ever teach your teachers how to develop kindness? <laughs> how to get the students to grow in grit, resilience, and empathy. Or you have sessions with your teachers on how to uh, prevent bullying in campus. So um, staff has got to be involved as a learning community that they too are given formation on how to do character formation more effectively. Shared moral leadership. It cannot be just the uh, owned by the president, the principal. And then I go down and I will even hear of teachers saying, uh, we don't know, we don't know what they, they just tell us what to do. Uh, there's no moral leadership there. There's no shared moral leadership. We talk to the student leaders and we ask them, um, does the school share with you the concern about how to form the character of the students? How to organize activities so that we are able to achieve the core values? Do you even know the core values? So shared moral leadership, it's not just championed by the coordinator for CEP, CEP coordinator in uh, Holy Angel University. They put up an office uh, just to attend to CEP, character education program, to make sure that everyone is involved. <laughs> okay, so shared moral leadership. Um, it's very impressive when you even realize, oh, they also made a parent part of the committee so that he or she will be coordinating with the parents association. Fantastic. That's shared moral leadership. And finally, a hallmark of a great school is how you work with the families, with the parents, how you get the parents to collaborate. And then, and some uh, schools I know that are very strong in parent homeschool collaboration, but they overlook, wait, you also need to reach out to the community. I mean, no matter how good your program is, the student goes out of your campus and there just at the corner is uh, you have arcade, computer arcade, where students can go even during school hours. Ah, you need to make the community as your partners. Tell the computer uh, arcade not to ad allow students. <laughs> to play during um, school time, or maybe even better, that they should be so many kilometers away, or right beside your school is a billiard hall, <laughs> and uh, it's known as the tambayan, as the, the place where these people hang out and kill hours, many hours of uh, their time <laughs> instead of uh, studying or working or... Okay, so these are the 11. We are going to go over each one of them. It's now 4.01 and um, we will be doing a little break in a while, but just to show you that every principal, every principal uh, would have three or two, three or four key result areas under, uh, under it, um, which you can rate as exemplary, highly effective, good or lacking evidence. That's what you're going to see in the um, CEP 11 principles handout.
that I shared with you. Okay. Um, so here's principle number one. Promote score ethical and performance values. They're dictated by their mission, vision, and it's not just a simple mission, vision. The mission, vision talks about values, ethical and performance values, which the um, stakeholders select. Okay. The, the audio when the host is speaking is too soft. When the music is played, it's quite loud. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Zoom. You just have to <laughs> uh, control your own volume from, from where you're listening. Okay. So um, under principle number one, there are three KRAs, key result areas or items to look at when we're scoring principle number one. Stakeholders select the core values, core values guide everything, and the core values are visible. Now I tell you, uh, I talked about Paref Springdale earlier on um, when Dr. Borba went there years before they applied for accreditation as a school of character. Um, the, one, the one showing them, uh, the one showing Dr. Borba around was a student, and Dr. Borba asked, uh, can I see your, what, what's your school's mission vision? Because she was looking for principle number one. And the student said, oh, uh, we have a tarpaulin of that. I'll bring you to the tarpaulin. But she could, he, the student could not explain it, okay? And then when we went there for the visitation later on, this is one of the first principles, the, uh, the one that they really worked hard on. Um, all the while, from the very beginning of the school, they had like a motto, a battle cry, bene omnia facere, to do all things well. <laughs> That's their motto. And yet, it was not present the first time we visited. But the next time around, when, we, when the experts came in to do the visitation, it's posted everywhere, on the board, in every classroom, along the corridor, Bene omnia facere. We looked at their memos, their letters to the parents, and all of them would always have a mention of bene omnia facere. We all we do all things well in Springdale. We want to do all things well. Uh, the class advisors mentioned it in the advisory periods. Um, class, do your best because that's what Springdale um, motto is: to do all things well. It was so visible. It was very clear they were guided by the battle cry to do all things well. It's amazing how even just principle number one transformed a school that Dr. Borba did not like <laughs> in, the, in the first visit. So that's how powerful principle number one is. If you just, for example, to prepare for the new school year, to have a battle cry, a motto, a... Uh, um, a byline that you will use to serve as your push, uh, as your guiding principle, as your uh, core value. That is how powerful it is. Now, let's take a look at stakeholders select core values, core values guide everything, core values are visible. Um, looking at the score sheet in that handout, the rubric. So here is, for example, number one. Principle number one, 1.1, 1 .1. stakeholders in the school community select or assent to a set of core values, okay? So um, it doesn't mean that you have to do this from scratch. Chances are your core values have been there, uh, put there perhaps by the founding fathers, by the founding parents or the founding owners of the school, and they've been there. But probably we need to get everyone again assenting to the, core, to the set of core values. This is the strength, for example, of PAREF schools, Parents for Education Foundation. The parents are interviewed before admission to the school. And not only that, the parents are asked to assent to the core values, to the principle that they have to get involved. 
to the principal that they have to collaborate with a school. And not only that, they have to, they have to sign a, like a contract, <laughs> like a, a, a memorandum of agreement with a school that they are going to abide by the principles of PAREF education. That's 1.1. 1. 1. Um, that's why, uh, well, PAREF schools stand a very big chance. They have many of these things already in place. It's just a matter of putting things in documents in order and then the evidence uh, that uh, the um, visitors, the, vi the accrediting team should be shown. Okay, so here is how you score, for example, key indicators of exemplary implementation, a highly inclusive representative group of stakeholders, professional and other staff, parents, students, and community members have had input into or at least assented to the school's core ethical and performance values. If the values have been in place for some time, current stakeholders have been involved in ongoing reflection on the values. We check, for example, um, do you interview the teachers that are hired? And in the interview, are they made uh, to understand that you stand by certain values? that you expect anyone who joins the community, the institution to comply with, to abide by, or at least to assent to. That yes, you have to assent to uh, being a man for others. You have to assent to uh, virtus et scientia as the goal of our institution. <laughs> Can I see um, your teacher uh, contract, you know, what they sign? To indicate that they are um, willing to join the institution, is there any mention there about uh, that when I affix my signature, it uh, means that I am assenting to everything that the school stands for, especially its core values. And then the staff, do they understand how and why the school selected those specific core values? I mean, why hope, H-O-P-E, yeah, a school has those four values as their core values. Okay, can you tell me each one of them? I mean, why them? Why not the other virtues? Do you know why? So the, the staff should know because the fact that they are working in that institution means that they are going to be the role models of those um, values, virtues. Okay. Key indicators, the second one, core ethical and performance values actively guide every aspect of life in the school. Key indicators of exemplary implementation, student, staff, and parents use common language reflecting the school's core values. Students, for example, students, teachers, or parents might use the word perseverance when discussing homework or the word respect when discussing relationships. There is staff ownership for teaching, modeling, and integrating core values into all aspects of school life. And core values guide hiring practices and the orientation of new teaching and non-teaching staff. Okay, so guides every aspect of life in the school. Um, I'm going to ask, for example, why did you organize a family day? Does it have anything to do with your core values? Does it have a bearing on um, what the school stands for? Why do you organize proms? Uh, is that um, to be able to achieve the core values of the school? <laughs> and why do you have sports fest? Does it have, does it have any bearing on? OK, now a good school of character would say, in fact, these are our core values. That's why we organize family day, um, um, Christmas presentation, a uh, Christmas uh, program for the non-teaching staff, for the auxiliary staff. <laughs> so you have all these um, explanations now uh, that direct you back to what the school stands for. We do all these things because we are guided by the core values of the school. And then 1.3, the school community articulates its character uh, related goals and expectations through visible statements of its core ethical and performance values. Visible, it's, uh, it's in every corner of the school. 
It's at the entrance. It's along the corridor. It's in every classroom. And then I asked for a copy of the student's handbook. It's there. I asked for the faculty manual. It's there. I asked for, can you show me an example of uh, your memo to the parents? It's there at the bottom. Bene omnia facere. Because we want the parents to know that this is what the school stands for. This is our core value. This is what we try to do in this school. Okay? So um, there is value in visibility. There is value in visibility. Um, some schools I visit, the only visible thing are the gigantic tarpaulins announcing the championship in Prisa, uh, second place in uh, this competition, third place in that competition. But uh, does it have any bearing on the, what the school stands for? Or is it simply marketing ploy? <laughs> um, that's what guides them, the attracting student enrollment. I mean, <laughs> increasing student enrollment. That's what's guiding the decisions of, uh, ah, you know there are some things that need to be worked on in a um, school like that. Okay, so your sample evidence says, if for example, your school is going to go to the accreditation and you have to prepare your documentations for the accreditors, these are the things now that you will have to prepare to make sure uh, they're there. Vision or mission statements, motto, touchstone, the bene omnia facere is a touchstone. Visible statements or lists of core values in school building, on website, in student handbook, planner, discipline code, newsletters, etc. And then concrete examples of how the core values are defined in terms of what they look and sound like. Okay. If you're going to do your self-evaluation, which is the first step, the, um, that score sheet, the um, um, 11 principles handbook, I mean handout that I posted in Facebook will contain this. These now are going to be your uh, self-evaluation. Get as many teachers to fill up this form. Our school staff and parent community have agreed on the characteristic traits we wish to promote in our character education program. Get all the teachers, for example, and all the non-teaching staff, and then some select student leaders to answer this survey. Are they going to put not yet implemented, in progress, fully implemented? It's the same as um, not observable. Um, observe um, every now and then, but uh, fully in place because it's very clearly um, implemented, it's observable. So things like that. No, number two is we have defined these character traits in terms of behavior that can be observed in the school, family, and community. And number three, we have made these character traits and their behavioral definitions widely known throughout our school and parent community. And we can even enumerate because we have student assemblies, we have talks for parents, the uh, forums that we organize for the parents, we have the uh, newsletters that we regularly send out to the parents so on a monthly basis. And the newsletter even contains a commentary on the virtue of this specific month. Ah, they are guided by values. Principle number two, comprehensive to include thinking, feeling, and doing, okay? Thinking, understanding, feeling, reflection, and appreciation, doing, behavior, students' practice. So what are the key indicators? The school, number one, the school helps students acquire developmentally appropriate understanding of what, core, what the core values mean in everyday behavior and grasp the reasons why some behaviors represent good character and their opposites do not. So do you have those so-called student talks or talks for the students? Some schools, they do it to do the class advisor. Okay, can I observe and sit in one of the class advisories and let me see, will the class advisor really touch on this topic? Or I'm going to interview two or three 
uh, randomly, no, I'm going to choose randomly students that I might meet along the corridor or that I might uh, ask the permission of the teacher to pull out. And then I'm going to ask him, uh, does your class advisor discuss values, virtues, character with you? When was the last time? Uh, what, was it, what was the context? So uh, from there, we're going to have a sense of uh, if they gave themselves a high score in this and the student will say, uh, no, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, maybe I need to interview another student in another classroom. Perhaps it's just, a, but that will already tell me of certain inconsistencies. Okay, so under 2.1, you have these three indicators no, of exemplary implementation. Let's go to 2.2. The school helps students reflect upon the core values, appreciate them, desire to demonstrate them, and become committed to them. I'm going to ask for, do you have journal writing? Do you, uh, are you students made to um, comment on the virtue of the month if there is such a system in place and um, how are you made to appreciate that uh, bene omnia facere is our guiding principle we did this we interviewed the student council the some of the student officers and it's amazing that from the students the words came out Bene omnia facere. Here we try to do things well. We interviewed parents uh, because in Springdale, they really try to make the, the students do everything well. I, it's amazing how when you have this um, joint forces, I mean, uh, really, everybody is made to think the same and um, have the same the battle cry or touchstone, or uh, as we mentioned earlier, mission, vision that is made known to everyone and everyone is oriented in it. Uh, they start thinking alike and saying the same things, using the same language even. And it's not because they were scripted, because some of the students we interviewed were chosen randomly. Um, and some of the teachers that we interviewed were chosen randomly. Um, with the parents, it's not random. We tell the school, prepare this number of parents that we can possibly interview at this time of the day and then another uh, batch perhaps after lunch, like that. No? So the visitation, by the way, usually lasts for a whole day. Um, and we request the school to set aside a, preferably a room where all the exhibits of the documents are placed. You don't have to put up a a spectacular exhibit, but at least it should be very easy for us in that one room to check uh, whatever document we suddenly think is worthwhile looking into. For example, uh, can I see your teacher evaluation? How, how do you do your teacher evaluation at the end of the year and their rating like that? No? Of course, these are highly confidential papers, so we uh, request the directress, the, re the director, the school principal, to um, see to it that uh, privacy is respected as well. But we want to take a look um, to be able to get a certain if uh, do they really consider these things even in teacher evaluation. Or um, uh, we want a copy of the faculty manual. Ah, it's there. We want a copy of the student's handbook. It's there. We want a copy of sample memos that you send out to the parents. They all should be there in that one room um, and of course a room where the uh, accreditors can peacefully discuss meet and even make decisions okay maybe we should look into this item maybe we should call for a um, group meeting of um, some heads officers and then another meeting with non-officers um, where the, the teachers will be very free to speak about whatever they want to talk about. Okay, 2.3, the school helps students practice the core values so that they become habitual patterns of behavior. 
So we're going to ask for, do you have uh, pictures of those outreach activities that you do? Community service. Uh, Springdale went beyond that and uh, uh, in fact had video presentations on uh, most of the major activities that the students got involved in. In other words, throughout the year, they were already of the mindset that we have to be collecting all these evidences. They become conscious of documentation, which is, again, a very good thing, not just for accreditation, but for future um, teachers, uh, future generation of uh, student leaders who will come and want to know how did they do it in the past. Well, we have this uh, fantastic treasure of materials available for us. Okay, um, we're going to look into, therefore, do you do class meetings? Do you do minutes of these meetings? Can I see if you, you have these things? Um, body system, do you have it in place? How did you choose the bodies and how did you do the distribution? Peer mentoring, cooperative learning, because it's a sign of a community spirit. I mean, that the students know how to deal with each other and work cooperatively with each other. And then um, examples of classroom routines and policies that help students understand and adopt core values. Okay, you're getting the idea now because as I said, I'm just going to go through the first three um, just for you to know what you are supposed to look for. And then the fourth principle all the way to the 11th um, the manual, the, I mean, the score sheet can serve as your manual, but I'm going to show you later even more spectacular materials that are actually available that you can also take advantage of. Principle number three, comprehensive, intentional, and proactive approach. Intentional at all levels, not just in grade school, not just in uh, some grades, not just in values education class, but that even math, science, teachers, can I take a look at your um, unit plans? Is there a effort to con connect to the core values in the teaching of uh, chemistry, in the teaching of biology, in the teaching of integrated into academic content that, you know, those outreaches that you organize, they're not just activities for the sake of having outreach activities. Look, even the budgeting of that um, Christmas party with the street children, it's part of the math exercise. They have to submit to the math teacher the accounting. Ah, fantastic. So it's not just about having activities. They are incorporated into the academic content. Um, so you go to student seminars, you even go to Bicol, fantastic. But um, does it have anything to do with academics? Ah, yes, they're going to submit in Filipino this report. For um, science, they're going to visit this uh, geothermal plant and they are going to be asked to submit a presentation there to the science teacher. For social studies, they're going to visit this uh, Balatas Basura, a community. So in other words, it's not just a matter of going out there, spending a few days uh, doing um, field trip. All the activities they have there will have a bearing on academics. Uh, and um, they try to incorporate all activities into the acad academic content, integrated into classroom routines, integrated throughout total program. So now I will realize why, ah, so that's why you push varsity team because that's part of your core value of uh, uh, creating a spirit of excellence. Good. Ah, so that's why your uh, school paper uh, uh, officers or members of the journalism club, they compete because that's part of um, communicating the truth and good and okay, fantastic. They are all incorporated into the core values, not just activities for the sake of having activities. So then I'm going to look at your character education plan, goals or even calendars. Calendar because 
Okay, when is your uh, faculty training? <clears throat> I we have inset one week before the school opens. Okay, when is the next time that the teachers will hear about discussion of uh, <laughs> the values, the vision, the mission, the um, what the school stands for? Uh, end of the year. Ah, that calendar will tell me that that's not comprehensive enough. I mean, most likely what they what they learned in the inset may not um, be as uh, easily remembered anymore one year later. So I'll be more impressed if uh, the school will show me uh, this is our calendar of faculty development session. And these are the topics that we covered this year. You see, every so often the thing of the values come out. The thing of uh, living the virtue comes out. Same thing with the students. The class advisors can tell you um, what are the things that he or she is going to cover throughout the year. So lesson plans or curriculum frameworks that demonstrate curricular integration of character or core values, expectations for behavior throughout the school that are tied to, tied to core values. Okay, so let's, from here on, we can go very fast because I want to be able to reach all the way to principle number 11. Principle number four, there's a company, for example, that learned about the 11 principles. They fell in love with this, creating a caring community. Just this principle may be enough to transform, to turn things around in a, an institution, in a school, in a company. Because um, look at this, student staff relationships. The teachers don't see the students as um, uncaring, um, always trying to break rules. No, the teachers, um, the staff really look at the students as people that they are entrusted with to form, to mold the minds of, to form the character, not just to teach science, English, and math too. And then students, with the students, care for each other. There's no bullying. And in fact, the students themselves come out with um, projects to foster kindness and caring and to prevent bullying from happening. They get involved in bully prevention, in peer uh, mentoring, in peer um, resolution, uh, conflict resolution. And yes, there is a program, there are strategies, there are activities in place to prevent peer cruelty. But wait, we're not done yet. We also foster teachers and parents working as partners, collaborating, not as two people in opposite sides of the fence, but that the parents see the teachers as uh, their partners in raising up their kids to become good men and women and not just someone who gives grades and that's uh, teachers also see the parents as their partners in achieving the academic goals examples of evidence uh, strategies that form good relationships between staff and students for example we have mentoring we have advisory system that is very strong. We even have tutoring. We even have teachers who make themselves available for, um, um, how do you call that? Revalidation class or <laughs> um, to catch up for those who are lagging behind. Fantastic. That's a caring community. Evidence, examples of staff interacting with students outside of the classroom, school, community events, mentoring, tutoring, or programs or strategies being used to build positive relationships among students, tolerance programs, anti-bullying strategies, class meetings, advisories, conflict resolution strategies, or examples of ways adults in the school community are brought together, Christmas program, celebrations, family day, uh, the teachers perform for the parents. The parents themselves get involved in the program. That's creating a strong community, a caring community. Okay, let's go to the principle number five. 
provide students with opportunities for moral action. It's not all talk. It's not all in paper. It's not merely all discussion. Um, there are clear expectations, moral action within school tied to the curriculum, moral action in the community tied to the curriculum. Again, as I said earlier, not just a matter of having outreach activities for the sake of having outreach activities. We tried to get those outreach activities relevant to one academic subject or another. Or it's the religion teacher that started it as an initiative and then the students um, work things out that they're able to practice. Okay, the um, slides are self-explanatory, which you all will get a copy of again, like all the other talks. Principle number six offers a meaningful and challenging academic curriculum that respects all learners. So it's not about lowering standards in academics so that we can concentrate on character. No, it's not about that. As I mentioned to you in one talk um, previously this week, um, yeah, as I mentioned to you in um, one session or another, concentrate on character, academic achievement will follow. But concentrate on academics only, uh, character will not necessarily follow. That's why you have schools where they're very strong in academics. So the students resort to cheating. The valedictorian is obsessed with numbers and grades and uh, the 0 0.01, uh, the parents will bring you to court for that. <laughs> I mean, I've, we've seen this case. It's a very sad thing. It's a very sad thing. Okay, um, there are many questions that are being brought up here. Uh, what is the Facebook account of CEP? I'm going to give it to you later, but uh, please go to facebook.com slash groups slash better teachers. That's where I posted this um, 11 principles handout. Um, that answers also the other question. Yes, Mr. Calado, all these things you used to champion in South Ridge, right? <laughs> Okay, challenging curriculum. It's not about lowering standards. Number two, challenging curriculum, but you have respect for the fact that people, uh, students learn in different ways. Do you factor that in? Or some of them learn in different paces. Some need more time than others. Are there ways to be able to help those who, is there peer um, tutoring done? Or is there teacher intervention in place? Addresses performance character. It's not just about memorization, passing tests that are based on full memorization. <laughs> Those who are able to memorize get very good grades, but that there also per the performance character comes into play. Okay, principle number seven, that uh, students intrinsically not extrinsically motivated that it's not all about i look at your program i look at your strategies i oh, oh it's not just about punishments and uh, rewards but there are uh, opportunities for students to do a lot of reflection so that they own this idea so that they uh, internalize and incarnate even <laughs> the spirit of the school behavior management and discipline tied to core values Academic integrity is stressed. That's principle number seven. Okay, so that, um, that the students are not following um, the rules simply because they don't want to get into trouble or they are working to get a reward. Unfortunately, it happens in some schools, right? Where, as I said earlier, some students are so obsessed with the uh, honors being able to make it to the honors list and so they can resort to cheating, lying, dishonesty. Um, it becomes so deformative because what um, motivates them is the reward, the recognition, the prestige, but not because they have to become good persons. That one has a lot of those uh, questions. 
that you can go to the step number uh, principle number eight you do not set aside the staff when the st staff here also includes non-academic staff that they too are made to participate in the formation of the students okay staff is a learning an ethical learning community that shares the responsibility for character education and adheres to core values so you put a lot of emphasis on staff modeling that they too you expect to be courteous that they greet every human being that they meet along the corridor because once they are allowed in by the security guard at the gate ah that is a guest that person deserves to be greeted good morning good afternoon we don't ignore or that we even offer uh, can i help you are you looking for someone is there anything i can help you in if all the teachers the staff the security guard the maintenance men the auxiliary staff the lady selling in the cafeteria if all these people we train to be courteous to be kind to be welcoming to be warm and and respectful in um, greeting visitors that transforms the school totally i know some schools that even just this principle number eight can totally turn things around for them staff development for all no exemption that the staff is expected to be an ethical learning community staff planning and reflection enough time for character education okay i love it for example that in schools like south ridge i'm sure woodrose they even have virtue stocks virtue stocks for the security guards janitors maintenance men can public schools apply for accreditation for character formation by school basis yes not by district wide basis which they do in the united states district wide school of character but in the case in the philippines yes a school a public school um, with a strong leadership in the first place of the principal owning that idea can um, apply for becoming a school of character and can be elevated especially because you're in a position to really uh, transform things and implement things okay uh, i'm going to ask for can i see your um, faculty development plan does it include discussion of uh, values virtues courtesy kindness like that no examples of resources provided to staff or faculty books reading materials even videos that you show uh, as part of the faculty development yes fantastic okay principle number nine third to the last shared leadership leaders champion effort and then we're going to ask who are involved in your this character education program that put in place all these uh, 11 principles if i see um teacher an officer ah you even involved a parent fantastic that's shared leadership oh you also involved students some of the students good that's great and a non-teaching academic uh, non-teaching staff fantastic that's real uh, shared leadership because you expect everyone to be involved and then a parent is even involved ah holy angel university even uh, invited an a graduate alumnus to join in the discussion fantastic because that means he can speak uh, based on his experience by the way in holy angel university it's not the entire university that underwent uh, accreditation it's only the basic education and the school of education okay so that's what they did and then now they're in the process of getting all the other school units to work on putting things in place so that they too can speak as an accredited uh, unit leadership group plans student leadership okay um, student involvement is very important in this principle uh, number nine in making this happen number 10 okay and i know parents for education foundation schools parish schools like south ridge woodrose northfield westbridge springdale rose hill they're all champions of this 
to the point that Brother Armin Luis Tro, when he was Secretary of Education, asked Taref, can you organize a um, conference on homeschool collaboration? Because they're the pioneers in this in the Philippines, and they are the ones that you should be visiting to check uh, how do you get the parents involved. But now we also include principle number 10 says, parents, fantastic, but don't forget the community. As I said, uh, for all you know, the um, drug distribution is just around the corner. You need to work with a barangay, with your community. Or why are you going all the way to um, um, Navotas to do outreach? It, right at the back of your uh, campus, there's a poor community there. Are you helping? Now you're complaining that there are robbers, thieves that cross your, <laughs> your fence ah, because you did not deal with that community. You are not reaching out. You're not giving a, a catechism class to the kids there. <laughs> or maybe even the adults, um, your uh, staff, even non-teaching staff, can be actually giving livelihood sessions with the uh, women there, the wives there who are jobless. They are uh, housewives. Okay, so that's part of involving the community, engaging the families, communicating with families, involving the community. That's principle number 10. <clears throat> and finally, principle number 11 is this, assessing school culture, climate, staff's functioning, and students' character on a regular basis. It's not just a one-shot one thing. It's an ongoing thing, like the Japanese Kaizen of uh, uh, always looking for improvements, better and better ways of doing things. Assessing culture, climate, uh, staff report on progress, assessing students' progress and behavior. Um, is there an effort to check, for example, the trend in uh, suspensions or the number of detentions given or sanctions, punishments, um, student retention, etc. So principle number 11 simply means that uh, this is not just a one shot thing. The three years that we are accredited as a school of character, um, it's a cycle. We keep on going back again and again, looking into how we are doing things. We keep on scoring ourselves again and again, over and over. Okay, so where do we go from here? There are questions already asked on, uh, can we do it? How are we going to do it? Okay, um, the first step, if for example, uh, you want this as your school improvement program, uh, you want, you've been looking for a way on how else can we do things better? Especially now when uh, we are in this situation of online uh, setup. Um, okay, we put in place already the synchronous, asynchronous, um, blended, etc. But how can we still be effective in our effort to really form character? Everyone is asking for that. I received emails already. Mr. Antoy, please. Uh, give us seminars in the future on online strategies for character formation. We need it. Everybody's asking for it. We're preparing. Uh, Dr. Grio and I, uh, I'm inviting also Mr. Salama to join in. We'll come up with all these um, strategies that we can share with you on how it can continue being done, um, forming character. So you want your school to become a school of character uh, for prestige, for the title or for school improvement. The first step is, well, you're going to do a self-assessment and that handout that I am sharing, that I have shared with you um, is your first step therefore. But um, the first thing, in fact, even before you do that self-assessment is to check on your school climate. How are things now at present? I, I mentioned in one session previously, there are so many climate surveys available online. Just Google it, school climate, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> school climate survey assessment tools. Well, it says here, visit assessment tools at character.org. 
they removed these materials. Uh, very unfortunate. I, I wonder why. Um, <laughs> I think they want to sell them. <laughs> but originally, when you go to that assessment tools, the page, there are so many different uh, climate uh, surveys that you can download there. But as I said, you can actually Google and choose um, any of those cool climate survey just to give you an idea, uh, are we even in a position to actually go for accreditation? Or maybe even just a school climate survey will already tell you, whoa, there are so many things that we need to work on. Communication in the first place. Um, teachers feel that they are disjointed. They are kept in the dark. Ah, nako, the survey shows you um, that the teachers feel like they are disconnected. Okay, maybe that's the first thing. The, how can you even create a caring community if, if in the first place, if in the first place, we need that connection? <clears throat> Same thing with the students. For all you know, all of them will be talking about bullying, victims of bullies, um, that they feel they are... Um, okay, so uh, let's get to practical things, no? Um, before you even go to the um, gathering supporting evidences. But that is the toughest part of accreditation. As those of you who have gone through PAASCO or um, PAKUKOWA accreditation, you uh, know that that is one of the biggest challenges, gathering documents, documentation, etc. So, you remember, we spent a lot of time talking about Harry Wong's first days of school. You look at Amazon, $34 ang mahal. But you know, he's, no, we're, we're not going to buy $34. <laughs> uh, he's a very good friend. I paid him $20,000 to come to Manila. And so here's a fantastic bargain he offers for you. $1 for the digital copy of the first days of school. Uh, um, just send an email to catalystpds at gmail.com and receive the information on how to go about getting the um, copy of the first days of school at 30 pesos only, okay? <laughs> Don't pay $34 plus $12 shipping just to get a copy of the presentation. Unfortunately, I didn't get to answer all the questions uh, about the costing, for example. I know a school the total cost for the whole accreditation that they did with the introductory seminar, the, the, admittedly, the most expensive is bringing in the experts, the accreditors to your school that I have to pay. So there's a school that paid total only 30000 for the whole system of accreditation. Some schools would have to spend more because they need more seminars on homeschool collaboration, on uh, creating a kind and caring community, on strategies for teachers be being, um, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> the fewer seminars, <laughs> the fewer seminars you need, the cheaper it becomes. Uh, it's even possible that in the end, the only thing you will have to pay for is, as I said, the accreditors coming over to your place, these are the, um, how do you call that, the experts for the visitation. 